Are we uh, live? Are we live? Yes, we're live. We're live now. Okay. I'm just doing my homework. All right. God, freaking late as always, O'Connor. Gee. You, you just distract the audience for a little bit longer, right? While I get the last few notes down. It, it's go. called vamping, Rory. <laughs> vamping cool. again. Yeah. Hi, everybody. It's Michael, your boy. <laughs> Uh, this is going to be confusing this week because we've, we've got two Michaels uh, and such. Yeah. That's going to be cause issues. We just have to refer to you as Big E all the time. <laughs> it's a pro wrestler. Sure. It'll do. Anyway. It's all or good. Emmy and MF. Uh, can we, can, can, if, if I'm going to be called MF, can I have the word sexy before it, like the Prince song? No. Sorry. Leaving <laughs> out of here. You no, did ask for that. We were live, but now we're not. No. <laughs> <laughs> Michael just gets up and walks off. Pulls like I somehow managed to like pull the server out at the uh, at the streamyard uh, entire setup. Mm. Managed to get the whole thing done. Anyway, it's Wednesday. It is Wednesday, my dudes, and mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're here, here again for another uh, Hub Games hangout. Yes, and oh. I'm going to be organized and say up front what we're talking about today. Yeah, and introduce people, like, yeah, to well, begin well, with. Well, hang on, let's just do one. Let, like, let's just ease into doing things properly. <clears throat> Mike, don't don't rush headlong in, Michael. Just gently bust into competence. Hang yeah, on, you'll, you'll set expectations. This is very uh, true. So, so there, Rory. go for it. Well, this week, um, well... Due to uh, scheduling issues, we had to kind of change things around. And thankfully, uh, I'm going to get this right, Michael was available at short notice to to join us for a conversation. And I mean, I know Michael from Gen Con, PAX East, meeting at a lot, lot of events uh, as a self-published designer uh -huh. um, and running a number of successful Kickstarters. But I don't really want to ki talk about Kickstarters and other people's games. So looking at his bio, I realized he... Uh, Michael, you had worked at a comic book store, coordinating yes. games at the store. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting to actually look at superhero themed games and like find an over, essentially find an excuse to talk about both comics and <laughs> games at the same yeah. time. Uh, and, no, I totally appreciate it. And thank you for having me. Uh, it's going to be an adventure. As I kind of put out in uh, on my Facebook post, I am in no way qualified. <laughs> to talk about this but i am passionate enough to talk about it and i think That's these days really that seems to be enough for most people so yeah we don't need no experts yeah. <laughs> we're three white men we know everything <laughs> that was said in sarcasm of <laughs> no. course hang on, hang on hang on hang on oh yeah hang on yeah <laughs> We've got an in joke now. Hooray! Yeah, if it's here yeah. for um, if it's here for two weeks, then it means it's like a guaranteed in joke. Mm. Um, so I sort of like, what superhero games do we think work? Like you know, good ones, bad ones, indifferent ones, that sort of good good stuff. And kind of what we'd like to yeah. to see because I, I uh, and we're also going to kind of like skim across, I guess, other because we were kind of making a list and going between the ones that we think are like. They're essentially licensed superhero uh -huh. games, and then there's the others that are yeah. not in that. But I think we could consider them superhero games, superhero adjacent or superhero, but not with the name superhero because Marvel and DC uh, own that word. Hmm. Do but they? They, uh, they do. Um, the term superhero is trademarked and is shared between Marvel and DC. It's a very that's weird bit wild. of book history, but that's why you always see people refer to as supers or super-powered individuals or whatnot, okay. but not superheroes. Do you know, I never, I never clocked that. I never thought, it's, like, because like, obviously, yeah, you know, we, you know, we'll talk about a lot of games later, but yeah, never see the word superhero. Mm -hmm. So if I if I make a game, it, it will feature heroes of a superheroic disposition, like very catchy. Just throws yeah. up some puns. Just, just, yeah, super From good. Metahumans to crime solvers and 
Crusaders. I don't know. That is wild. It's also strange that it's um, Marvel and DC sort of like working hand in hand as well, because uh, it's... working hand in hand to prevent others from help from benefiting from it. But yeah, I mean, true. Also, <laughs> you can just picture them at the top of the treehouse. Like with their legs out, like stomping down on the fingers of everybody else who's gotten to that top rung, <laughs> just kicking them off. No, nah, superhero. This is our superhero. Get off. <laughs> You're not allowed yeah. to say that word. Yeah. Well, this is even without getting into the whole Captain Marvel thing. Uh, oh, yeah. Because there's a whole lot of history back there. Um, That's a different show. But yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to stop you right there. I get I get the feeling I'm going to be going down some sort of weird rabbit hole after the episode, trying to find out about a load of stuff. Because my yeah. comics history, we, we'll, we'll talk about sort of like comics history and stuff as okay. well, I'm sure. But uh, love it. Yeah, mine has a rather significant gap in it, and what I have is pretty focused. And like it's all typing. Marvel and DC. No, it's not. It's even less than that. It's just one half of that, and out of that, maybe like five books. So I don't know. I'm curious which ones those are, but we'll wait to answer that. Later. Yes, is true. So we're up to what good good stuff have been happening. Um, Rory, what have you been up to? Uh, I well, I've been in a lot of moving. Uh, this with family stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. My brother move house. Um, but apart from that, I heroically decided to play Warhammer Fantasy Wobbling Game solo because uh, Cubicle 7, amazing uh, team and publishers down in Drogheda, which is the correct pronunciation of it for everybody, uh, they uh, published Warhammer Fantasy Wobbling Game. I uh, liked a copy from them, and uh, it's been sitting on my shelf waiting to be played. And I also wanted to try the DM yourself um book uh by tom scott which is a guide for how to play with pre-published uh essentially D material so i thought i would give it a go by trying to take this thing that was written for D and combine it with warhammer fancy role-playing game because i love the setting like that whole like dark uh really medieval dark. germanic setting uh-huh. i love i could take a leave the demonic aspect of it and the mutations but i just love the really gritty nature of that setting um how to go so <laughs> I've, I've gotten onto act three of the um the kind of uh, starter set um uh, which is i'm role-playing like a conversation with a car with uh, a character i would say to avoid spo- spoilers so I, I kind of had to pause there but i'm trying to figure out how to make that interesting beyond what's written what's meant to happen in as outlined in the actual guide. What I will say, the starter set is amazing. Like in terms of literally open this and start playing, I've never read an RPG that does it better than this. Now granted, I haven't read a lot of RPGs, but I've read a good few. Um, and it just drops you straight in. Like hand out these sheets to people, have them pick one. <laughs> Don't read until you choose the character and go. And it basically explains Okay, we're going to do tests now. This is how you do tests. Okay, when you've done this for a while, now you're going to get into combat. Okay, start combat. Now, second round, introduce this. Third round, introduce this. Fourth round, introduce this. Let it run for up to eight rounds, then have this happen. Like, and then you move on to the next scene. And it also. Rocks fall, everybody dies. Yeah. (laughs) And it it kind of says, don't be afraid to just like fade to black, Uh which I think is actually a really helpful lesson. To learn as a as a DM, um, I I agree entirely. Um, I've been just as a segue. I've been running a lot of one shots for mm-hmm. folks um, over the pandemic via Zoom, and being able to really close out a scene quickly, even when they're maybe not fully done with combat mm-hmm. or done with an interaction, being able to say, "And then you finished this and got to here." Is very helpful for these one and a half, two hour sessions. Mm-hmm. You sort of like get to um, accelerate it on just that little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, like an 85 ball. minute fight. So I also, into the mix through Mythic, 
uh, which is the kind of Oracle system for kind of role-playing games, uh, alongside for Street Cubes, just to give it a nod. Uh, and uh, I pronounce it UNE, but it's UNE, the Universal NPC Emulator, um, and and the Book of Random Tables, uh, which I had picked up from watching. How many books are you working with? <laughs> well, so that's what makes it quite complex. Um, <clears throat> But to be honest, I came up with these really funny uh, characters <laughs> that run a, a shoe stall. Um, and because they're at the random NPC generator said they were like short and stocky and wearing mages robes, I was like, but they're a merchant. Why are they wear wearing these robes? And then I rolled to see what kind of merchant they were, and it was a shoe stall. And I was like, oh, there are these guys who like, <clears throat> I came up with the name of like Sanford's uh, Splendorous Shoes. <clears throat> and the, basically it was their whole hustle that they would like, Go with, like these magical shoes, the likes of which you'll never find elsewhere in Reichland. Um, <clears throat> so it was a whole spiel they put on. <laughs> but I just love, like, <clears throat> from rolling a couple of dice, this kind of <clears throat> these characters have come to life and they are going to oh. play some significant role at some point in the future because they're just, it's just such a funny concept. <laughs> kind of picturing these very chaotic, money hungry gnomes mm. in these. Cloaks and be like, yeah, we're gonna sell you these shoes. We got these shoes. We made these shoes. Well, yeah. The funny thing was, I rolled. Right, in the, the funny thing was, I rolled an assistant for them, and they also had an S name, um, and they were short, and they had mages robes. That's why I went right. <laughs> this is their shtick. So it's like the son <laughs> who's who's working the the stall with them as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting big uh, flim and flam off of My Little Pony vibes mm -hmm. off of. Uh, on top of that, you know, just here to <laughs> trick everybody. They'll learn their lesson eventually. It's all good. Uh, anything else you've been playing, Rory? Anything good? Um, I've played, well, Marvel Legendary just before we went live. Uh, mm -hmm. but I'll talk about that as part of the talk, I guess. Cool, cool, um, cool. I don't think I've played anything else. Nope. Let's flip on over then to uh, our super special guest, Michael. <laughs> Uh, what, what, you, what have you been up to? So you've been mentioning that you did, you've did. you been doing yeah. some uh, solo, well, not one shots, I mean, not solo RPGs. That's Rory's, very much yeah. Rory's bag. Uh, what else? Rory, I am interested in trying out some of those books that you mentioned. Uh, send me the names later. Mm -hmm. um, or post them in the comments for all of our readers and watchers. Um, I have been, so pandemic hit last year. Uh, right after PAX East. Um, PAX East, we were on Kickstarter for Chiseled, um, a deck sculpting card game, which uh, succeeded, thankfully. Um, and then everything went to hell. Um, and we are one year out from that. Uh, Chiseled released in November. Um, since then, I've just been pushing it as best I can. Um, it's available in stores worldwide. Yay. Um, yeah, here. Looks kind of like this. It's a reverse deck building game about sculpting marble. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. Um, it's all right. So, we did say shameless plugging is entirely fine. So it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also have a couple of copies of Pigment left. Uh, this one's. Like, <laughs> oh, no, hang on a second. <laughs> all right. All right. So. Uh, See, I but knew you'd do this. Doing well, and so I'm working on uh, future titles for Copper Frog Games. Um, since we focus a lot on the artistic games, um, there's three titles that I'm currently working on. One is um, about tattoo art. One is about uh, Egyptian tomb painting. Um, and the other is a uh, follow-up to Pigment, uh, kind of expanding the bazaar, um, titled aptly The Grand Bazaar. Mm -hmm. and cool, cool, cool. so I've been working a lot on those I've been working at the shop a few days a week still uh, as the event coordinator there are not many events happening right now because we can't, can't think away <laughs> Tough. Um, but we've managed to get a good online magic community together um, and keep that together um, running commander nights every week and doing pre-release this past week and so I've been playing a lot of Magic um, and generally playing a lot of prototypes on board game uh, emulation, such as Tabletop Simulator. Um, and I've been playing a lot of X-Wing. 
the X Wing mm-hmm. miniatures game has been one of the shining points I've found in the last year. Virtually, uh, yeah. Yes. Because uh, every time and I, I also got a starter set for my dad, for oh, holidays, okay. and we've played that a few times, and it's really fun. Um, cool. What platform are you playing it on virtually? Is it Tabletop Sim? Uh, tabletop Sim, yep. Uh, there is a mod called the X Wing uh, 2.0 Unified um, system, which mm-hmm. has everything. And it automates the movement, it automates like range finding, and it's really, really <laughs> good and well scripted. Yeah, so there's definitely no official, way that that's official. <laughs> but it is a really good way to learn the game. And the Discord community is, and then buy, and then buy all the stuff afterwards. That's yes. kind of what I'm doing. Yes, to support the publisher. <laughs> um, I, I strictly fly rebels because that's all the ships that I've bought in real life. That's very noble. It must be said. Mm. I gotta say, I, I, every I time I sign into Twitch, not that good. All right, every time I sign into Twitch, it's. Um, I have a look on the board games category, so I see what's up, and I guarantee you, nine times out of ten. There's always a well attended X Wing stream happening, mm-hmm. like triple digits at least, and loads and loads of people in the chat having having the good times on it. It's it's yeah. it, it seems to be that good, but I would yeah, love it, to eventually get streaming that. Yeah, it it does seem to be a um, a community that has held together really well over pandemic, which is cool. And yeah, obviously the you know the magic is another one that just it seems to work well online as well, but you know, yeah. Wizards have put an awful lot of effort into making that much more, much more accessible and much more streamlined for everybody. Well, how have how have way. have there been any events like live event stuff? Like, how how do you deal with like a live like a, a launch of a block or whatever? Yeah, so Kaldheim pre-release was this past Friday hmm. um, at Omar's. Uh, I work at Omar's World of Comics and Hobbies in Lexington, Massachusetts, United States. Um, we actually were able to do physical cards online. Uh, Wizards of the Coast recently acquired a program called Spelltable.com. And for Spelltable, um, you just put your webcam down at your play surface, um, and it actually can identify cards when you click on them uh, in the video and kind of pops up their stats and stuff on the sidebar. So it works really well for Commander, but we also were able to use it for sealed. So you got your six booster packs and your promo card. Uh, we gave you basic lands, and for a few rounds, we just played sealed magic decks, like 40 card decks. Mm-hmm. And it so worked really well. Um, we had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. The set's really cool, and I just really enjoy getting the community excited and coming in and picking up their packs and then going home and being able to play all together see that's i like the fact that you can play with the physical cards that's the thing for me i don't really want to play uh with the the digital ones but as uh, ken points out (laughs) you mean we can get money and not even print I mean, yeah. it's true. At, least, at least Pokemon do the whole, hey, the cards that you've got in this deck, scan this, and away you go. So you yeah, I mean, at least get the digital in, uh, Yeah, but it doesn't work with the boosters. You get cards um, with a code on it for um, packs in Arena with your pre-release kit. But on the other hand, hmm. like, I still haven't redeemed mine. Interesting. So what have you been doing, Michael? You've been painting yeah. online? I've been trying to paint online. And I'm very bad at it. But at least I'm trying. That's the important yeah. thing. Hang on. I'm, I just happen to have mm. an example of my fine, beautiful work behind me. It's not great. Um, it's kind of I think brilliant. you need to go full screen, Michael. Hang on. Let me... I'll do Nope, wrong person. <laughs> I guess the other one. Yeah. Don't show me. Is that a caterpillar? It looks crap. <laughs> it looks awful. Oh no, that's cool. But like and I put like and you put your grass on. I put grass on it and everything, like properly. <laughs> like the other ones that have more things on them are, are a bit better. So there's a cat with its bowl. 
yeah, this is really crap. I'm sorry. Oh, um, but I'm still proud of it. So I don't care. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, I have um, I have very, very pretty bad social I got so well, I have bad social skills, but I also have bad um, <laughs> physical dexterity <laughs> a lot of the time. Um so that's taken me basically four at four hours of work trying to just get all of these painted up and colored in and sort of stuff like that um but it's working and mm. they're looking they're looking pretty good <laughs> so i'm just reading yasa's comment <laughs> the mage knight minis looked a lot worse <laughs> <laughs> It's all right. Erin er is proud to me, and that's that's what I care about. That's all good. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, as long as you're <laughs> happy with it, then that's all that really matters. I mean, yeah, because I know it's not going to be a good. great hobby for minis. Um, I don't play minis games, is my biggest problem. So I don't have any minis. Get out. <laughs> oh, Thanks for watching okay. the show, everyone. It's been great. I feel like there's going to be some hate thrown my way for this, <laughs> but I don't have the space or money for minis. I just, the reason I like the X Wing minis is because they come pre painted, pre assembled. No mas, no fuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, Ken, Ken does say X Wing is a minis game. But yeah, they come entirely pre done. So that's all cool. Yep. And you um, can modify them. Yeah. I choose not to. Yeah. Yeah. You could paint them up and I can look busted up and everything. That's all mm -hmm. cool. Uh, Traffic, what have I been playing on? Folks in the chat, can you remind me what the hell we played on Friday night on stream? Was it not Welcome To? Or was that the week before? Yes, it was Welcome To. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was good. Like I, I, didn't, I remembered something. That's shocking. I know. Congratulations. Um, so, yeah, we played that, a couple of games of that. That was fun. Um, and it reminded me how much I, I really love that game. It's, it's such a clever, clever game. I remember when um, you and I first... I was played it more. yeah because we, <gasps> we, we were at, um, when we first played it in Reno um, at uh, Gamma I want to say yes yeah yeah, yeah. Gamma trade show um, because Maggie Bot had got me a copy of it so it was like so good uh, but yeah I still have that copy and it's absolutely cracking and it works very very well playing on stream as well so you guys played at Nerd Night right uh, there, I was at Nerd Night at Gen mm. Con, um, but I was upstairs running the live stream while the what 160 people at the at the Nerd Night event were also playing it, which was very yeah. very cool. I, um, I, I almost won. I was, so <laughs> I was like five points off. That's good. But, uh, we, what we did, is, like Ken mentioned, there the Welcome to app is solid. So basically, you just yeah. grab the app. Um, it's it's just the score pad. Um, so I was running the cards and everything through my my side cam, mm -hmm. and we were just <clears> playing it that way. It was absolutely cracking. Oh, that nice. was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I cracked out uh, Tiny Towns as well. Mm -hmm. I I've finally got a copy of that. Uh, so I've been reading through that. I'm going to play that solo tomorrow um, on stream to the, see how that goes. Is it the yellow game? The AEG one. Uh, the AEG. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, um, Griffin, right. Hmm? Dan McPherson, I believe. Uh, he designed or it. Paul, or Paul. It's definitely it's definitely a McPherson for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, that game um, that game's delightful. Um, mm -hmm. and I think the theme is great, and the art is so cute. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I, it, I, I love. I, it. I've been wanting to get a copy of it for a while, and um, it, it arrived in trade. Uh, over the weekend, so it's just like, okay, right, let's make that happen, get it going. Um, and other stuff, just working on designing other weird games. I did a little 18-card uh, game about racing Zeppelins. Nice. Welcome to the uh, airship Haggis McGinty. Uh, it will fly around the world. Uh, so, yeah, we just sort of, like, made that on uh, made that on stream a couple of days ago, and it was uh, it was really good. I dig it. Um, well, before we jump in, I was saying I've signed up for the tabletop mentorship program, and I've got oh. two mentees that I'm going to be working with. Oh, you got two? Okay, cool. Yeah, foolishly, but uh, <laughs> it's like I had so I had my first session with one of them, um, and 
really interesting because it's like I have a very different take, I think, on game design, and I don't. I keep saying this. I don't have the normal the skill sets that I would associate with what people would be looking for uh, oh. in in game design. No, I'm, um, I'm curious. Why do you say that? Um, because <clears throat> when I look at when I was looking at the list, like we had to go through the list of of mentees and what they were looking for, and I was like, help with Kickstarter. Mm, no, not very good at that. Help with marketing. Mm, not so good with that. Help with balancing my game, and like like mm, not so good at that. So it was kind of like. Uh, trying to figure out how I would be helpful to people. But there was someone mm. who was looking uh, for experience as a developer, which again, I was like, well, I've kind of fallen into it, um, but I can't tell you what the qualification is that you need to be a developer. Um, Just develop games. But like, share yeah. them. <laughs> designer, you design games. Share some <laughs> interesting, um, like, you know, my take where I'd always say, why does this game exist? Or why should this game exist? Uh -huh. <clears throat> I kind of asked them to go back to all of their projects and ask that question. Um, and then figure out how to amplify that in each game. And one of the insights was like, oh, I've been asking that wrong question. They've been asking, like, uh, would I play this game uh -huh. as their filter, which they realized was kind of um, focusing the games only for them rather than thinking about the wider audience for games. So, uh, But it's also made me go, I want to develop my maths side of game development um and so you, could, what, you don't want to you don't want to access this this big beautiful brain this thing but, here but i have to do it my, like i have to be able to do it myself and to be able to kind of qualify things that's so, true uh, yeah um that was always the hard part for me was the math yeah um so i'm gonna be working on probability i think and distribution it's the most boring thing yeah. <laughs> I mean, I get. I guess I say it that it's boring, because I just sort of we we discussed this before, like both on stream and in the office. Mm -hmm. I basically like my eyes glaze over, and it's like I see the matrix in front of me, and like it's just green numbers and letters falling down from the sky, yeah. and it's just sort of like okay, we'll take that one and that one, and that works, and then sort of like well, now we have a game, <laughs> and that's like I think we have our our kind of natural strengths or our resting position. And we can always work on stretching ourselves to move into uh -huh. a different space. And it's like, I always think of it like those, it's a knockout type shows where you've got the rubber band and you can stretch so far and you're like reaching out trying to do something, but eventually you're gonna snap back to your own place. It's just uh -huh. a matter of like improving your strength so that you hold that elastic in that other area a little bit longer. So that's kind yeah. of what I want to do is just you yeah, have to stay cool. in that math space a little bit longer than I normally do. <laughs> Without flipping the table in absolute rage. Yeah, Just or spend less time it. because it takes me so long to work stuff out. <laughs> Just well, no, I, 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 I require any math. <laughs> no, I'm glad that you, um, you you signed up for it. The, the only reason I didn't is because I realized that I already have two mentees that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, um, maybe I'll sign up for the one later in the year once I've dispatched these two into the mm. into the great gaming blue yonder and it will be cool but would you sign up like what i find interesting is like i think i'll sign up as a mentee next time mm -hmm. I, I think i might do that as well <clears throat> um like my like i hate marketing um so it's definitely something that i could improve on uh and hopefully you know somebody who's experienced it it would be able to sort of show me the right you know Mm -hmm. show me the the light as it were to sort of say look you can do this you are you know you are capable of doing this mm -hmm. um you know i've got good experience in a lot of different areas but marketing is definitely an area where i fall pretty flat so uh yeah i think it'd be interesting to sort of see if i could sign up on that side yeah and, and michael you were saying that um just for you it was more a matter of kind of time and headspace at the moment yeah, it's been a stressful year. Uh, I assume many of our viewers agree with that. Um, but it has also just been a time when I'm trying to focus and failing. Um, mm -hmm. It's like I'm getting a lot done. It's just not focused enough to really leave space for someone else. Mm -hmm. It's not That's... you, it's me. Um, it's kind of what it boils down to. <laughs> um 
but I would definitely be interested in devoting some effort to either mentoring or menteeing mm-hmm. um, in the future as well. I think it's a fantastic program. I've seen people uh, get great results out of it, mm-hmm. uh, learn a lot in a very short amount of time. Mm-hmm. And I think it's good for the mentors as well um, because the best way to learn something better is to teach it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that it's a program that I, I'm very glad exists. I wish there was more like it um, in the board game industry. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like video games have incubators and like startups have incubators. Board games don't. And I understand the finances behind it or why, but it would be nice to have. One day. Mm. One day. <clears throat> it would be more akin to like a writer's group, you know, where you can go and, and do a residential for a period of time. Exactly. With other writers to work on something. Like you're working with a team of people mm-hmm. who've done this before to make your game better. I yeah. think it would really be just a I think we go. I mean, I, th- I think with like the growth of um, things like game jams, um, especially like, you know, analog game jams as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think that's kind of our our version of the incubator at this at this time. So like uh, next week, for example, Bez from Stuff by Bez is running a week long game jam, uh, which I'm going to take part in. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 not just because, hey, yeah, I, I want to add another game onto my list of stuff that I'm making. It's because I want to work in and amongst the community with with people and like fire off ideas with 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 other folks. So um, yeah. The idea of like a residential, I know that there have been groups in the States who've done basically like week long residentials. Everybody goes and crashes at Retreats, a, yeah. a, a big rented house for a week. And then everybody's sort of like working and testing everybody's games. It's it's mm-hmm. a pretty cool idea. I don't know if we can quite do that here, but don't totally. know house is big enough. Yet in 2021. <laughs> yeah. Don't it go like just rent a place? And a castle. Yeah, loads of castles around here. It's great. Love that. (laughs) One of these Um, days, come visit you guys on your home turf, and just I will be the happiest. That sounded like an invasion attempt. (laughs) I'm going to come and visit you on your home turf, and then (laughs) be my home turf. This is the birthplace of American liberty. We beat the British (laughs) ones. Um, (laughs) It's. Sorry, that's actually not true in the least. Um, there, that's there right. Was, I was just mentioning that anybody's British, British on this yes. battle of Lexington and Concord, and the powder reserves in Concord were seized. And well, yeah, you gotta you gotta check your history, Michael. No, I, I <laughs> we won the war. Just my hometown didn't do so hot in the back. All right, well, on the subject anyway, of heroes. Before superheroes existed. So, uh, <laughs> <I> wanna... <laughs> just moving swiftly along. Yeah, I was going like to say, on the subject of heroes, let's talk about this week's topic. Mm. Um, so, Roy, what's the, um, like the, the wide ranging topic for folks who well, might just be jumping in with us? All right, I'll repeat uh, what Ken posted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I well, just gotta go back and find it. Oh yeah, well, what's this super- topic? One yeah. division. <laughs> <laughs> so, what superhero games do we think work? Yeah. So, what maybe, superhero yeah. games do we think work? And it was more as actually just to look at the overlap between games and, and comics. Uh-huh. Uh, what games have kind of captured it well? What haven't? Uh, what would we kind of like to see in it? And possibly, you know, what other comics would we like to? see as uh, game IP as well. But shh, don't say that loud because Renegade or AEG or somebody will snap it up before we have a chance yeah, to do it. Nick, they just announced their Regrets Co game and I'm furious. Yes, yeah. I did love the title though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Work Rage Balance. Yeah. I'm kind of here for it. Um, so Yoss would like to start. Uh, I'm not there in the comics, but on Monday DC announced Dark Knight's Death Metal Band Edition and I need to get them. I mean, if, any, yeah. if there was any comic that is on brand for Yoss. That's kind of it. Mm. That's all good. They did, uh, I think, they did a series, uh, uh, yeah, a Batman series that was a death metal series with... Yeah, it was just, uh, it was just called Metal, wasn't it? Maybe it was, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's, 
Uh, Knights in Battle? No, what is it? With, uh, what's the name? Scott, the writer. <laughs> this is terrible. Um, <laughs> I, I'm i going to be perfectly honest. So I'm more of a Marvel guy right now. Um, DC Comics have been kind of hit or miss for me. Mm -hmm. um, the last great DC comic I read was the Wonder Twins, actually, which ended last year, and that comic was delightfully funny and weird. Mm -hmm. It was a good superhero satire, which there I don't think is enough of. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will mention one in a bit that I think everybody should read, but um, I did want to ask about everybody's sort of like comics history, I guess. So like I was alluding to it earlier. Um, obviously, you know, I have seen all the MCU stuff. Uh, I've not read a lot of Marvel ever, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, I did specifically, did a, I did a big sit down and read through all of Civil War, um, the, mm -hmm. the the comics run of that and all of like the, the, the side spin-off bits of that. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really... Um, interesting sort of like piece on you know peace on freedoms and societal norms and that sort of good stuff i thought it was a really really just good good story and it was interesting seeing how they kind of adapted and changed it for the um, for the mcu as well but really my comic stuff when i was a kid was because i grew up in the uk of course it was 2000 ad mainly um so judge dread rogue trooper strongium dog that kind of stuff but when i did um uh, and Zenith. Zenith. Oh, and Zenith, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I did discover um, that we had a local comic shop in our town, down in Harrow, mm -hmm. when I was living, um, a place called Calamity Comics, um, which I swear to God, the first the first time I walked in there, it was about, Rory, you know this room that I'm in? Like yep. the back office? <laughs> Half the size of that. Right. And it was a comic shop. And it was like floor to ceiling, just what the hell is all this uh so i wandered in and the guys behind the counter were absolutely lovely welcoming folks and they recommended me hey okay well why don't you try this why don't you try this why don't you try this uh and i walked out of there with a stack of dc stuff um so because justice uh like a new justice league america had just started up mm -hmm. and justice league europe was just coming in as well uh, and I read the hell out of them. So then Green Lantern, like so the uh, Hal Jordan, Guy Gardner kind of uh, kind of era of... of uh... Sorry, I don't know that one. Stop it, Alexa. Uh, so yeah, that, those, those were the comics that I read a lot of. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Marvel was never a thing that I got into. I don't know why, it just never seemed to click until the movie started, I guess. Michael, what about you? What's your your vibe yeah so uh where to start uh as a kid i watched um the justice league and superman and batman animated series um i actually the first superman cartoon i ever saw was the ones from the 1950s mm -hmm. um, those were stupendously amazing good animation uh, especially for the day and like they were so influential on in how Superman was perceived and how superheroes were perceived going forward that I, I treasure the fact that I got to see some of them um, mm -hmm. when I was young. Um, but growing up in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, I did not read comics very much. I read some manga, um, so uh, stuff like Dragon Ball and uh, Mobile Suit Gundam. But I never really was into Western superheroes until Iron Man came out. So the first movie in the MCU. Uh -huh. um, I really liked the MCU. Um, but again, at that point, I was more focused on Dungeons and Dragons, gaming, board game design. I was in college at the time. And so it was really tough to focus on picking up more hobbies yeah. um, than the few web comics I was reading. Um, but then after I started working on Omar's, I was like, I really need to remedy this fast. And so, uh, I looked for an interesting character who had a series starting up soon. And I just read that. So mm -hmm. in 
case, it was Captain Marvel's uh, The Life of Captain Marvel series, mm -hmm. um, which was very good, uh, very interesting twist on the character um, and her origin. But it really also kind of led to, okay, now I'm going to read some other Captain Marvel stuff. Okay, Captain Marvel's interacting with this character. I'm going to read that. I'm going to, and it kind of bounced around. Uh, mm -hmm. I listened to recommendations from my manager. Um, Tyler recommended like the Unstoppable Wasp, for instance, and so I read that character, loved her to pieces. Uh, so I started reading all the characters that branched in from there. So Ant Man, Daredevil, um, ultimately. So it's, it, it's like a, a natural chaining kind of thing, yeah. really. Like, yeah. Modern Marvel comics have a lot of crossovers, even mm -hmm. if they're very minor or just mentioning something that's going on in the world. Um, one of the best examples of this is Gwenpool. Uh, Gwenpool is a character written by a webcomic artist who I really like, uh, Chris Hastings from The Adventures of Dr. McNinja. Um, and this is one of the most self-aware texts that I've ever read. And I was an English major in college, so I mean text as in like an academic. Uh -huh. Like This thing is just so unique and metatextual and self-referencing. And like, it's it sticks it to Marvel, to the fans, to the writers. And like, it's one of the most mind-blowing series I've ever read. Uh -huh. And it ties in so well with the Marvel Universe as a whole because Gwenpool's character, uh, Gwendolyn Poole, is from our world. She is a Marvel fangirl who gets somehow transported hmm. to the Marvel Universe. So she knows everyone's secrets. <laughs> and uh, I would, I should probably read this. I yes. should check this out. Okay, <laughs> and now I'm suddenly interested. Like, uh, the unbelievable Gwenpool. Uh, she first appeared in the background of a Howard the Duck comic okay, um, at a holiday party. And then they just were like, okay, who's that in the background there? And they made this series, and it's it's very, very good. Mm. Like, That's cool. It that just had me in tears. It was just so <laughs> well done. Um, but yeah, I like Marvel, uh, especially like post twenty fourteen, which was like Civil War two. Um, they did a Civil War two. Mm. Yes. <sighs> okay. It's, it's actually interesting because it takes that idea of policing super powered individuals to policing mm -hmm. everyone else with superpowers. Okay. Um, kind of revolves around this one inhuman who can see the future. And so what are the legal and moral and ethical ramifications of stopping crimes before they happen? Oh, it's like minority report, but superheroes. Okay, mm -hmm. I got you, I got you. Yes. All right. Yeah, the, the sigh was not a, oh, God, God, just like rehashing things. It was more a, God damn it, I'm going to have to go and read it. Yeah. Um, and so, in fact, there's yeah. some really cool Civil War II tie-ins that I'm reading, uh -huh. uh, including one that has Gwenpool in it. Um, in this case, it's volume two of Rocket Raccoon and Groot. Um, which just is a wild and weird comic. But I digress. Um, Rory, how about you? What do you what's your comic background? So I just want to put this out because any time a sequel of anything yeah. is mentioned, it must always yeah. be referred to as Electric Book. <laughs> of course. So Rory, you obviously, you had the, the 2008 yeah. upbringing as I did as well. But what else sort of floated your Flo boat? Flew to your boot? I think... Um, it's funny, I think comics have like just permeated my life from drawing characters, uh -huh. like getting getting my homework done in school really quick so that I could start to copy characters from comics. Um, and so I would have grown up with a lot of uh, like English comics like Buster and Beano and Wizard yep. Chips and Dandy and all of that stuff. Uh, Bunty, um, Mandy, all of the girls' comics as well. Um, my aunt used to work in a comic shop, and we'd get like the comics a week late if the, people didn't buy them. Um, I'd read the football ones, the war ones, whatever I could kind of get my hands on. Um, so yeah, I was very much buying the kind of English stuff, which I do have to say, I probably annoy people. I I think it was far more rebellious at like at the time 
mm-hmm. than what was happening in the states because of it was all political like all of the stuff we were reading especially in the late 70s early 80s was all political um so you know uh, judge dreads john jim dog rogue trooper a lot of that stuff was a, definitely a statement about society mm-hmm. and the, the thatcher era um <laughs> But yeah, so in terms of like the kind of comics content, which in the states was generally kept fairly clean a lot mm-hmm. of the time, um, the comics code. Yes, um, and my friend who we used to play Marvel, uh, the role playing game with Marvel superheroes, um, he had this massive collection uh, of uh, Marvel comics, and I eventually gained his trust where he would like loan some of them to me, and I like I devoured like. He had almost like the complete run of X Men. He had uh, oh, new New Mutants. Um, oh, Avengers. I wasn't into. It was mostly kind of X Men. So I got like all, a lot of that early stuff. Yeah. Um, and then when I started working in a pub, I'd use my money to buy the comics in Forbidden Planet. So I was like the kind of Excalibur era. It was really when I got into uh, reading comics. Um, and I've just the over the years dipped in and out of things. I usually. Uh, kind of recently with comicsology and with traveling, I realized I could like devour a whole series on my iPad and I would always kind of buy up whatever was on discount for me to kind of check out and try. Um, and reading comics, um, they would recommend, like sometimes in the letters page, they would recommend another series. So I discovered a lot of Rick Remender stuff um, and Powers by Brian Michael Bendis. Uh, so yeah, I've kind of read a lot of stuff. When I was working on Batman then, on the um, story cubes, I went back and read a whole lot of Batman, some of the classic stuff, and a lot of the key stories, because I wanted to make sure I captured the key tropes from uh-huh. those tales as well. Yeah. And that's when I kind of actually then started buying the whole the Scott Schneider. Um, his kind of reboot of Batman as well was incredible. It was like the first time I'd read a Batman comic in years, and I thought, this is what the Batman is in my head. Uh-huh. Whereas always it never quite kind of matched the character that I pictured. Um, so I think I'm widely read, but not deeply read, I think, in terms of okay. superhero stuff. Nice. I've just ordered Gwenpool volume one, so there you go. Done. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> I'd yeah, forget Gwenpool. about it otherwise. Yeah, Gwenpool is delightful. Um, the other one I recommend. So if I'm going to recommend three comics to you, it's going to be Gwenpool, Unstoppable Wasp, um, especially Unstoppable Wasp Unlimited, which was the second series of it. Um, and Tony Stark Iron Man, which was from a couple of years ago, the Iron Man run examines technology and society in such a weird and interesting lens of superheroes meets technology and society. So you've uh-huh. got the military hardware, you've got the industrial espionage, you've got VR, you've got robot rights, you got online dating and society. And all of this kind of viewed through a tech superhero lens. Oh, would recommend. Cool, cool, cool. All right. I have a reading list. I'm good to go. Yes. So, so here's a big question. Why do we think that superheroes go hand in hand so well with games? So I actually have a really good answer for that, I think, because it really puts you in the driver's seat. That's always the thing that games do that movies books comics don't Uh they let you do these actions you are the one saving the day you are the one stopping the threat and i think with that power fantasy that a lot of people have of being able to make a difference in the world uh as a superhero that ties really well into games where you are in the driver's seat doing these various actions whether that's trading gems to build up your trade routes in Splendor or um, punching Baron Blade in the face in Sentinels of the Multiverse uh, to prevent him from launching his uh, moon Terra Lunar impulsion beam uh, to pull the moon into the Earth. Like, you feel really good when you get to wield this power. And so I think it just is a natural extension from... I'm doing a thing to I'm doing a super thing. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think um, a lot of games is a, about that. You might call it the, the kind of power fantasy. Um, 
but, but also mastery, having a sense of kind of control over something. And games allow you to explore that in a kind of safe way. And yeah, the superhero game kind of just makes that a bit more apparent and I think connects it to a, a theme or a media in our kind of everyday life that we can relate uh-huh. to as well. Yeah, I mean, much. But this is one of the things I also think it's one of the shortcomings of the superhero games, which I'll come back to. Yeah, we should talk, we, we will talk about that because um, there is, you know, the, the, the elephant in the room, like, you know, the biggest superhero game around at the minute is undoubtedly Marvel Champions. You know, it's mm-hmm. selling incredibly well. It's a game that you and I both really, really enjoy, Rory. Um, Michael, I don't know, have you played it much or have uh-huh. you? No. Okay, but you, but you're aware of it. You've seen it, and you know, yeah. seen it around. Yeah, you so, um, and it's you know, we Rory, you and I, we both think that you know, it's a great game. We both really, really enjoy it, but we know that it has major shortcomings. Um, mm. but let's before we, yeah, yeah, before we kick in with that, let's talk about some of the uh, like the superhero games that we love, the superhero games that we that we enjoy, the, the and the stuff that it does really well. So, Roy, let's kick off with you. We just bounce back and forth on different ones because I have a whole yeah. list. Yeah, yeah. Do you want just to like comment? You know, if we've played them, we can jump in, oh. comment, that sort of thing. Uh, looking at my list, the first one I have on the list is Dice Masters. Um, I used to play that with uh, Pedro a lot. Um, he used uh-huh. to work with us. Um, he, when I would beat him, it would be such a satisfying experience. Um, essentially, Dice Masters is based on Quarriers, which uh-huh. and I think fixed some of the issues where Quarriers was essentially a defensive game. Yeah. Um, and Dice Masters made it into a kind of more, you know, active, um, aggressive game. I like, I think what I liked is how they captured the kind of the tone of the characters um, uh-huh. and the, the team building aspect of it. Um, and made it clear, because I think this is one of the issues with some of the other games, but it's very clear you're building a team that's working together and you're you're fighting it against each other. Um, the wonderful thing, I think, is just that serotonin kick you get when, or dopamine kick you get when you roll the dice and see what fa- faces you're going to get in order to buy your, your characters. Um, but yeah, I think it's like qu- quite an easy one to learn. And quite satisfying to play. The, again, the downside is the collectability and those booster packs. Dear God. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I totally agree with a lot of what you're saying there. That idea of coming together as a team and building your own team really plays into my favorite superhero game, which is Sentinels of the Multiverse, mm-hmm. which we got to mention from Yos as well. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, Sentinels is one of my favorite games of all time in part because of how deeply they captured the superhero feel. Uh Uh, The game starts, the villain attacks first. um, And so you're reacting, you're trying to kind of get everyone in order. You're trying to get all your powers equipped. You're trying to get all your um, minions dealt with so that you can pull it out at the end and defeat the villain. And I think that comics really read that way. Um, the heroes have to react. They can't be proactive mm-hmm. against their villains uh-huh. or anti-heroes. Um, and so I think that the way that they captured that narrative arc of either succeeds or fails um, in that cooperative game with such a deep love of comics so apparent, mm-hmm. uh-huh. it, it, it's it's a work of art. I, I think I'll have to go back and revisit it as a co-op game because I, I actually after we kind of said we'd have this conversation I, I took it out again um to to have a look at it i played it with my family which they were kind of younger at the time and then tried playing solo and i found the bookkeeping aspect of it challenging for solo for like yes <clears throat> it could have been that my children were quite young at the time and i wasn't getting much sleep um, but I found the bookkeeping and and knowing when certain things had to trigger trigger and which uh-huh. things you had to resolve in order, I just went, no, this is too much for me for for what I want from a solo game, yeah. and that's why it got put on a shelf. But so I'd be yeah, interested to I, kind of take it back down again. I 100% hear that there is a lot of bookkeeping. Uh, there's an app version of it from Handelabra that's great. Uh-huh. Um, Handles also for you. That as well. um, it's also on Steam, I believe. And recently they announced that they're doing a revised version of it. 
um, kind of the masterpiece edition with mm -hmm. all new art uh, and some simplifications apparently, and that's supposed to come out around Gen Con. Uh, as someone who owns everything Sentinels of the Multiverse, including all the promos and stuff, I am a little sad about this. Mm -hmm. But I'm also really excited for it as a way to help introduce people to this game a little easier. Uh -huh. Because there is a lot of bookkeeping. There is a lot going on on the table against some of the tougher villains. Um, Oblivion, we played for two hours, got about halfway through, and had to give up because we were just like... It's taken forever, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. This guy's not gonna die. We're gonna <laughs> run out of we're gonna run out of steam before our characters run out of steam. Man. That's understandable. I mean, I, I'm I'm always gonna have a soft spot for Sentinels of the Multiverse because it was one of the first um first games I ever actually reviewed, like as a as a as a proper writer kind of thing. Um and uh, the uh, uh, Christopher, of course, one of the designers, was one of the uh, was on a very very early episode of my podcast, Little Metal Dog Show, uh, and we sort of like got on pretty well. And you know, every time we see each other at shows now, it's like you know we still we still catch up. You know, we're mm -hmm. good friends, and, and it's it's lovely to see him. Uh, and the game, I really do enjoy it. I, I love the fact that they basically they lock themselves away in a hotel room for you know a week. And came up with this. Actually, no, it was, it was a weekend, a sprawling universe of characters, some of which, you know, felt very familiar because, you know, you could see what tropes they were based on. And then some mm -hmm. of which were just sort of plucked from the stars above, sort of thing. And it was, it was absolutely wonderful. So, sort of like seeing this world develop as more and more um, expansions came out, like Rook City came out. Um, shattered timelines, like when shattered timelines happened and everything went sideways, like for, for the people who were playing it, it was like, holy crap, this is just, this is huge. Um, yeah. And just like the introduction of like, you know, all the little extra characters. So like when Unity was released, everybody went wild over Unity because, hey, she makes little robots and they're awesome. Uh, one of whom is up here. Yep, Mr. It's Chomps. Mr. Chomps. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I love so it. It's, it's a great game. I'm still happy to play it. The fact mm -hmm. that they not only created this world, but they created a world where Sentinel Comics was up there with Marvel and DC. Like, mm -hmm. they created a whole publication history. Yeah, they, which didn't exist. Right. <laughs> and I love telling people that in the shop. Like, I'll pick this game up and be like, this is my favorite co-op game. It's based on the world of Sentinel Comics. And they're like, oh, yes, yeah, Sentinel Comics. And then I'm like... There's quotes from the comics on every card. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. There are no comics. Yeah, they don't exist. And it throws them for a loop at first, but they think it's cool because so much heart went into the creation of this game. Hmm. And hmm. like they've been hinting at stuff since the first box that was going to happen 10 years down the line. Like hmm. they had it's, it's all. It's great. And like it, they it, had it, that. Um, ARG that ran in to for the announcement of Oblivion that used stuff from all three of the games, like the mobile version, the app, and the cards. Like there was there were clues hidden there years before this. Like that that blew my mind. And that like Christopher is mad genius. Like I love that guy. <laughs> and Adam, his art is so evocative and like and just, I love that company. Greater Than Games are some of the coolest people in games. Um, <laughs> I've always thought so. Their office is really nice, um, or at least their old office. I went, I went to St. Louis a few years ago, and it's really cool. I know. I, I, I think, I think it, what it does really well, what it does best, is the. It's the world building. Yeah. That's like, yeah, I, I think if we were to pick something from each of the games that we mentioned, I, I think it's the world building and the the cohesion between the different characters. Um, and yeah, the, the, the fact that it does feel like you are a team mm -hmm. and you're fighting against this big bad. Um, and it, it does it really well. It feels a little different. So yeah. I'll, and stuff. Yep. I'll allude to the thing of, for me, it's going one step closer to what I'd want to see in the game, but it still doesn't do it. Uh -huh. 
like in in a, a superhero game. All right. So just just dropping that seed in there for for later on in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. Um, one thing. Sure. Yeah, I'm, uh, Rory. What's or sorry, Mike. Well, yeah, Michael. Yeah. What would be one yeah, you would what, name? What's the first one that springs to mind when someone says superhero board game? <sighs> or superhero tabletop game. I mean, a lot. I I would have to probably mention first like the Marvel superheroes RPG. Um which I played a very small amount of because remember I grew up in the 1980s and if you played RPGs you got the crap beaten out of you every lunchtime um so I read a lot of them and I read a lot of the source books um like the the Palladium Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles RPG for example is one that will always be close to my heart especially like the uh, the Art of the Bomb one um but the Marvel superheroes one I remember going to like the local hobby shop and going, what is this? Why are all these tables on it? And like, you know, saving up pocket money for a few weekends and handing over my coins and walking home with just like this weird box and just making up stories um, by rolling dice. Who does that? Um, yeah, it was, it was a really sort of like it, a strangely sort of like mechanical yet evocative walk in a world hmm. that i didn't know a lot about um but it also because you were making your own heroes up mm -hmm. um i think it, it 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 sort of tempered your imagination because you know the kid can have like the imagination uh what their imagination would go yeah my hero can you know fly and they can punch mm -hmm. through walls and they've got x-ray vision and they've got and they've got and they've got it taught me about limiting i think um mm -hmm. very very well you know, so, you can't do everything. Have you got a character from that that you remember? I had a weird sort of like ice, Iceman esque character. Um, I imagine it's because I was I was probably watching the Super Friends cartoon as well, uh, or Sp uh, Spider Man and his amazing friends. That's the one. Yeah. So yeah, and I I, I think I was because I, I was must have been around like eight or nine. So I was like small and stupid and just thinking I was like, oh, super clever, like doing this weird spin-off version of Iceman, but like from that an early. island. Huh? You're playing it that early? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Dude, I had no friends. I lived on the other side of London where I went to school. So I know, my friends were that. my brother and books. That was it. That would have been like 83? Mm-hmm. 83, 84. Okay. Yeah, this was, well, it was probably 80 nine when i was playing it um my character was doolittle um oh. talked, that's the one i remember and uh i think it was I gotta she, work out. Am, am, am i am i looking at the right dates let's have a look she, she could you take over <laughs> communicate with animals what's nice. her thing yeah, I, I never played the marvel superhero rpg but i did play a good bit of mutants and masterminds mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Mutants and Minds is wildly complex and nigh unusable as a system to play with, in my opinion. But for building characters, it's super fun. Mm. And so, like, um, the most recent character I ever made in it was the Bubbler. Um, he's from mm. Boston, so he technically is the Bubbler. Um, but he's this guy with this interdimensional bubble wand. That like shoots like hardened bubbles mm -hmm. and like, can trap people in bubbles and like um, they're very slightly um, basic. So like acid goes right through them, and so like it's like soap bubbles. But mm -hmm. like channeling elemental energy, air and water, you have bubbles. I like that. That sounds cool. Yeah, um, well, because we've jumped across to. <laughs> We've kind of short circuited the conversation. Um, Sorry. When it comes to kind of role playing games, there's also um, icons, which, again, not play, but it's, a, I think, a more streamlined form. Um, and then masks would be the other one, which is quite different, uh, which I think is worth coming back to. Um, but I think, Michael, the thing you hit on with um, the character creation, i that's the thing that I think is. Keyly missing from 
tabletop superhero games. Okay. Um, so we're kind of cutting to the chase here, right? You, in pretty much every game, you're playing somebody else's creation. True. Yes, um, very true. Yet, if you think of fantasy games, you create your character by equipping them and outfitting them with equipment and items. Uh -huh. um, you know, so in the fantasy side of things, you do it quite often in the sci-fi space you do, but in the super superhero space, I, I can't think of a game right now where you build your character based around... I, I, I can think from, of one. From a board game perspective. Yeah, here is, here is a Metro City. You, awesome. you built your character from the ground up, but even like okay, so here is a metric city. It's got like a, um, it's it's got a good fan base. You know, as a game that was mm -hmm. well received, it's like people did enjoy it. But it's strange because I remember sort of like watching it being demoed at a few shows, and people were kind of almost reticent to create characters. Like you know, they would play, mm -hmm. but they would always be basing like me as a nine year old basing them off something else that they already knew. Mm -hmm. Um, because maybe that's because like the superhero games that we all play and that we all enjoy, we are playing other people's characters. You know, we are putting ourselves in the shoes of mm. heroes that already exist. Um, but yeah, it was it was interesting. So like watching people feel a bit strange about creating superheroic versions of themselves, which is kind of what Metro City encouraged mm. people to do. You know, this is you as the hero. What would you do? What would happen? I I'd forgotten that because I do have that game. Um, there you go. For me, I think it was the deck building aspect of it just didn't mm. jive properly with soup with the theme. I think for for me, um, I'll have to go back and look at it again. But I think um, so. There is a, a theme under which I think that would work, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's an aspect of that hampers a lot of the the licensed ones like Marvel and stuff where, you know, if you license a game, their whole thing is like, you have to play with our characters in our world. Uh -huh. um, but if they took um, inspiration from kind of, uh, oh, what is it called? Um, don't you do the cleanup? There's the kind of cleanup crew yeah, where you're control. almost like damage control, but where you are another character in that world, uh -huh. And you interact with the other heroes. Like to me, if you think Ms. Marvel starting out, like her dream is to meet kind of uh, Captain Marvel, okay. and she's awed when she meets the others, but she didn't exist until a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. So she was created from scratch. So yep. why can't we play games where we're the young up and coming kind of heroes and we interact? Like when Thor or Spider Man turns up, it's like, what? <laughs> They're here. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's one are. of the most important things about some of these superhero games. Um, the Sentinel Comics RPG, which just finally released, thankfully, I'm, I'm very excited to get a table together of players for that. Um, like they have, where are the heroes from the card game? Where are they? What are they doing? What are their stats? Uh -huh. So you can interact with them, and I think that was a really good choice. Um, you can interact with all these locations, but you can also create your own. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a really important thing that it included. Um, I mean, I've got superhero teams I would love to bring into a game, but on the other hand, like having that good touchstone of like, okay, I know who Superman is. I know what he does. Um, I know what his ideals are. I know what his motivations are. I know what his power set and weaknesses are. Like having that touchstone really does help GMs, if nothing else, uh -huh. um, to understand the power levels of their characters and like what kind of stories you can tell that will excite those players who want to play those characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's I mean, one of the big things that makes role playing as superheroes very difficult. It's hard for the GM to get everyone to fit together sometimes. Uh -huh. But I, I think that's why. Um, it, it's strange, like, yes, it's difficult to role play, you know, to, to, to role play as superheroes, um, but people still enjoy it, mm -hmm. I guess, because it's very, it's very simple. Like, it, it, the vast majority of, like, shall we say, classic comic book stories 
um, are very black and white. It's very good versus evil. You know, the bad guy wins a bit, the bad guy wins a bit, the bad guy wins it, and then the good guy comes in and cleans all the messes up and everything's fine. And it was when stories started going sideways, I think that comics got a bit more interesting. So, you know, like the death of Superman, stuff like that. What do you mean Superman died? Yeah. It's 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 when when that was first announced, I remember that it was like, you know, almost outcry amongst certain fans because you know Superman was this infallible, unkillable mm. being, you know, this deity. Mm. But I think as as comics have grown as a medium, um, and it's weird because I think like it's almost like British comics had a had a, a head start in it because Rory, as you mentioned earlier, you know, British comics in the seventies and eighties, you know, the two thousand ADs, etc., um, did have a very sort of like political drive to them. It took a while for the Marvel and DC stuff to catch up, I think, to mm -hmm. for the maturity to to sort of blossom within the stories. Mm -hmm. um, and now. You know, we're we're entirely okay with having very sort of like human stories about superheroes. You know, we it, it's not just sort of like the hero comes in, punches the baddie, and flies away, and everything is great again. You know, we get to see the darkness. We get to see the fact. You know, what these people's lives are like in a lot of the stories, and that sort of widening of the characters, I think, makes. I, I think that opens up like role-playing superhero stuff mm. to a much wider way of, uh, of playing. It'd be really cool to sort of like, you know, the day-to-day -day life of, you know, Captain Marvel or something like that. Mm. You know, Captain Marvel it, goes to the shops. <laughs> there have actually been whole books on that, mm. um, including like um, Patsy Walker, a.k.a. Hellcat. Um, that book is actually delightful because it's her basically – quitting the superhero thing for a bit to start a temp agency for powered individuals. Mm -hmm. And then there's like the life of Captain Marvel, which is really going into her childhood and like why she is the way she is and like her alcoholic father and like that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you get all these really cool stories that haven't really made it into games much. Uh, Rory mentioned icons and masks Masks especially focuses a lot on like that inner torment you may have as a young superhero, um, which is good, but hasn't really made it to board gaming yet or mm -hmm. card gaming. And so I'd love three, to. There's two things I think that are can definitely be developed. So in addition to I think you being your own superhero, I that's one thing I would want to see more of. Uh -huh. um, one of the other things is. Um, for me like part of the the kind of magic of like having superpowers is the interesting ways in which they use them like they find another use for it to do something that was unanticipated and their power set kind of increases because of that you know it's almost like the um skill the, 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 the fastball special um uh, between colossus and wolverine like where they did that in in one issue and then it became a thing uh -huh. that they did so they learned this new thing and it kind of became canon then after that point done. so that idea of a character it you can do it in a role-playing game because you can ask gm can i do this and they're like well give it a try <laughs> and if it works then you can kind of go okay that's that's gonna become easier for you to do in the future yeah i, I don't think they've quite we haven't quite captured that in games yet but i think that would be an incredible thing for your character to kind of grow in that way and and partly that comes to the kind of challenges you're presenting the characters with um where you're not just you know essentially everything is a form of attack whether it's uh -huh. psychic or physical or like whatever well, it's still an attack it's broken down into the most basic form so i think we need to look at that aspect of how the powers are actually used um and then the other aspect i can't I got to give credit to the poster on BGG when they were talking about like what, where does Marvel Champions fall short? And it's that issue is that you're constantly just pounding on the villain, uh -huh. like that's all you're doing. Um, and he and the the poster were saying, but if you look at a comic, the whole thing is about that reaching inside and finding something in yourself 
so it's ultimately the hum human aspect of it that enables you to overcome the the villain or the threat or the thing that's happening and so that's that drama personal aspect of the the kind of superhero element huh. is partly what's missing and i think that's it's a synergy maybe between those two things between giving like non-attack things that you have to deal with and then having it's that kind of closed it's a kind of closed box where this is the power set you have to work with now how are you going to use this to solve that problem yeah that's something in role-playing games that i think has really improved a lot mm -hmm. in recent years i mean i think fate for example the system is all about you can attack, you can defend, you can overcome an obstacle, or you can create an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that utilizing your powers in interesting ways to do those things comes very naturally for that type of system. On the mm -hmm. other hand, you then sometimes get into near omniscience if you get a character with a power that is not, it does not work as intended. Uh, mm -hmm. Like if you have someone who can manipulate atoms, it's like, okay, I can fuse or fission atoms. Okay, suddenly you've got someone who can create a thermonuclear weapon out of thin air, or they can literally like empower themselves by just grafting more stuff onto them. Like, uh -huh. where do you draw the limits? And I think that's one of the problems that you run into um, where a system like masks which is based on the Apocalypse World engine, you succeed, you succeed with complications, or you fail. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Those kinds of systems, I think, are a lot stronger for the superhero genre than something like a D20, D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. I hit it, it dies. Mm. I mean, so uh, Marvel Champions is, like I said earlier, it, it is, it's one of my favorite games. Hell, it was my favorite game of the year when it came out. Mm -hmm. um, and... There's, it, it's weird because there is that sort of that sort of like two sides of the coin. Like I love to play it, but I realize that it is a very simplified take on the superhero genre. Now mm -hmm. we've we've spoke about it plenty. Like you know how the characters, like the character pre uh, pre made decks, they do feel different. You know mm -hmm. they you can you get the right vibe from the right characters and it's like little weird things as well like the fact that the ant-man card flips out to double size and it's all that good good stuff it's those little touches which really make it um fk and elena no pun included uh did a great review video of it uh, a while back uh where they said yeah the it's it, it the the shortfall is it doesn't matter who you are you could be Ms. Marvel, you could be the Wasp, you could mm. be Hulk. At the end of the day, you're still just punching things. It was Efka, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's who it was. <laughs> so yeah, you are I mean, just you're, you're you're just hitting things to break them, and eventually the villain will yeah, break. But I, I or you will. I or think will. what will have happened is because you have to think of the release cycle and the development cycle of the games, and I think. Guardians of the Galaxy is one of the ones where you're start. I think you're going to start seeing. I think we started to see it shift a little bit with Kang, and I think uh -huh. it's going to start. They're at a point now where I think when I try to kind of gauge the development cycle, I think they should be at a point now where they're going to be t able to take on board what has emerged since the, from the game since it first yeah. uh, kind of launched. So I think whether Guardians of the Galaxy, you might start to see some stuff happening but i i would hope whatever comes after that is the one where we really see them kind of experimenting with what uh the scheme schemes can be and the kind of encounter decks yeah, yeah. well uh, you know I mean, we, like, we, we know that the game is selling well we know that it's 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 still selling well um so hopefully that ability to experiment will will open up mm -hmm. a bit more sorry michael i interrupted i apologize not a problem not a problem no i i agree that like as the design, they realize what its shortcomings are, they can react to that. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is how long that takes, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're not in the industry themselves. Um, but one of the things that Marvel Champions doesn't do 
that I think Sentinels of the Multiverse does very well is it put it doesn't put you in an environment. It doesn't have bystanders. It doesn't have hazards. It doesn't have things to deal with. Like, oh my gosh, there's a ticking time bomb. Oh my gosh, there's a hostage situation. Oh my gosh, the monorail is derailing. Like, it doesn't have any of that to kind of split your focus. And uh, I think that's one of the you get the side scares. But it all comes down to punching it. At least as far as yeah, my history. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and so I'll I think by punching them. in preparation for uh, the conversations tonight, I dug out Marvelette uh, Legendary. Legendary, which has been sitting on my shelf for quite a while. I traded for it. Um, but because I started playing Marvel Champions, I was like, oh, I don't really need Marvel Legendary until I started seeing more and more people saying it was great for solo play so i took it out and played it solo and it, it does have some nice things like so i think to, it's really weird because with marvel champions i think it's abstracted some things because of the deck flipping and, and things kind of you know resolving whereas um in marvel legendary you see stuff progressing along a time line and it's like if this gets to this this card moves over to this point it's going to trigger something so it's a bit like um Thunderstone, okay. where you have the threats moving forward. So I, I kind of, I went. I do like that aspect. I do like there's a physical thing moving, and I can kind of like punch a hole in the middle of it to slow it down, or like take out the one that's getting closer to the edge before it triggers. You're doing that kind of with tokens in um, Marvel Champion. So the idea of like the bystander is a token that's being added. Granted, it's a card in this, but it's a visual thing um okay. and it it does have some cards that don't contribute any attack at all they're just kind of um but they're essentially just extra card draw and and the thing i kind of find different with that as well is you're just pulling you're building your deck out of multiple cards so you don't feel like you're a hero you're using the benefits of different heroes but i also don't feel like it's team it's like i'm just triggering the strengths of the different characters without feeling like they're a team and i think because there's no persistence which is what you get with marvel champions like you are that hero and everything you play is tied to that yeah hero which is what's missing from um legendary so i'm just taking boxes to make sure i covered yeah <laughs> different games uh, as i'm talking yeah for one more role-playing game that kind of deals with superheroes in a really interesting way uh, the Cypher system from Monty Cook art from Monty mm -hmm. Cook games. Um, w that idea of like you're reaching inside yourself, you're finding that one thing inside of you that really helps you save the day. Cyphers do that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that was something really cool that they touched on in their book. Um, the core rule book discusses how to use superheroes settings um, with Cypher. And I think like having like you draw on that lesson or you draw on this experience that you've had or you mm -hmm. draw on that thing that you read that one time and use that to gain that extra edge. Like that's mm -hmm. something I think a lot of games can benefit from when they're dealing with the theme mm -hmm. of superpowered individuals who are still human. Like, yeah. And even if they're aliens, mm -hmm. like that idea of just human. Mm -hmm. And then like, I think so enamored with them. There's one other game I want to touch on, at, at least, um, and then maybe kind of talk about the kind of future stuff. Um, Heroclix, uh, because it, what? It, I don't like it. So yeah, there's a lot it of better. It's probably guys. the biggest amount of superhero minis in the world. Like, mm -hmm. I mean. WizKids has done great with it, but yeah, what do you got to say, Rory? Um, I think the click system, the dial aspect of it, is a really, really interesting implementation of capturing a hero like over time. Um, so that one, you get what the game ca captures is a, an element of the physical aspect, um, a bit like Crisis Protocol, because you're moving stuff spatially around the board. So if you, th if you think card games, they've just abstracted the whole notion down to numbers, whereas with a, the kind of minis games, you're also including a, at least a bit of space. Uh, 
you know, and positioning as as part of that gameplay. Um, I think the thing that kind of won me over when I saw Hulk, like the more damage the Hulk took, he got stronger on on the dial, which I thought was really interesting. And you don't, and the elements that you didn't necessarily know when they were going to like be KO'd. Uh-huh. But because you couldn't see, it's not like you can look at a card and go, oh, I know when they're going to be run out or I know their hit counter, it's going to run out. Now, the problem with the game is it's totally like the people who had studied the game would know oh, Hulk's got, you know, 10 clicks and then they're gone and they study that whole thing. But for not for a casual player, I think it's got some incredible stuff that kind of got ruined by the excessive collectability, um, yeah. the the kind of min-maxing that went on. Like, it drove me nuts when people would take, like, two Alfreds into a game uh, because they did this incredibly beneficial thing. <laughs> it's like, no! Like, play the game thematically! Um, yeah. So, my, like, myself and John, <clears throat> uh, Fiore, co-designer on Untold and Prison Arena, we have fun when we, we meet up in New York and get to play together because we totally play it thematically. But it's a game I can't see myself playing again, uh, given the complexity of the stats and, and what it got to. But I, but I still, I think there's something incredible in it that's been lost over time. Can you, like, I, I'm going to, because there's Marvel characters and there's DC characters and all manner of different characters. Can you do crossover stuff? You know, can you do the, hey, who'd win in a fight between such and such and such and such? Some of them you can, and some of them use a different system. Okay. So I think you could have like Hellboy, that, that like that set could go up against a DC character or a Marvel okay. character, but I don't think you could, you can't combine it with like the D&D set or the Star Trek set or the Halo Dice one. Masters because they can. Sets. Hmm? Dice Masters you can. Though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Those can all be interchanged, mm-hmm. which is nice. Um, yeah, there's not much crossplay allowed, despite again that shared mm-hmm. trademark. Um, I am going to touch on quickly just to tick boxes. Uh, Crisis mm-hmm. Protocol. Uh, I think we've had conversations with the Asmodee team about this, and um, that as a game, I think the gameplay is quite fun and interesting in, in how it works. The biggest problem with the game is the price. Like in terms of who they should be bringing into that game, it should be kids and families uh-huh. uh, totally priced for the hobby uh, market. Yeah, like a $100 plus starter set is going to hurt any game, but yeah. But does it mean, like, but imagine being able to play a game with like Shuri and Black Panther and uh, Ms. Marvel and stuff like that. That would be so much fun, but I, paying that price for it, mm, it's kind of hard to justify. Yeah. That's another thing I like about X Wing. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like sixty bucks and mm-hmm. you're done. That's just fun. All right. I'm going to wrap up with our final question because yeah. uh, we're coming up on about an hour and a half. Um, if you had your way, if you had your druthers, as it were, uh, what comic book, what superheroes, what license, basically, would you? would you like to see and what would you do with them so michael's gonna stand up first (laughs) yeah so i would do the champions um the champions are a younger team post-civil war ii from marvel it's miss marvel um viv vision uh kid nova uh amadeus cho the hulk um and miles morales spider-man uh basically are fed up with the way the adults are looking at the world of villains and heroes. Uh-huh. And like, look, everyone needs help sometime. And like the adults are kind of just going in, smashing the thing, flying away. What about that guy's food truck that they just destroyed with the villain's head? Like, what about this bridge that needs to be repaired? Like, why are uh-huh. you not helping everyone? Mm-hmm and like dealing with some of these more structural societal issues, like they address racism, they address human trafficking, they address environmentalism in these comics. And I would like to do a game where your heroes solving those kinds of problems, Uh in addition to dealing with 
villains who can thrive in the dark places of those problems. That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I like that. So like expanding out the expanding out the the things that the heroes can do. It, again, it's not just yeah. going in and punching and then running away. Yeah, that's cool. What about you, Roy? We, we can call the game Climate Crisis on Planet Earth. <laughs> uh, climate Crisis on multiple Earths. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm I'm kind of half joking. I actually think that would work quite well because I think yeah. that game that uh, challenges how you use your powers. Um, the obvious one for me. Um, like I'm, I'm a half fan. I'm not like a hundred percent fan of it at the moment. Uh, is the pride? Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So like, I love what it's doing. Um, in terms of kind of representation, sometimes I kind of feel like Joe is talking straight to me. You know, um, you want, about, some folks might not know what the pride is. Right? We, I do, so, but you know, I'll just mind up. Yes. So the pride is an independent comic uh, written by Joe Glass, um, who I've had the pleasure of meeting i think at a super comic con a couple of years ago and it features a lgbtq plus uh superhero team uh -huh. um that he'd been publishing independently and then it got picked up by comiXology uh as kind of their series so it's gotten a lot of promotion through that where they went back republished the first series published uh -huh. the second one i think he's working on the third at the moment nice. um the, the second series definitely turns it up a notch and it's it's kind of really interesting but yeah, I feel it, like it's so great to see the, the the variety of characters, and I'm learning a lot by seeing the inter interactions between the different characters. Um, though there are times where I'm like, you're just hitting this on the head a little too hard, or you know, the metaphor is a bit a little bit too kind of obvious in in the representation. Huh. Um, but just as a different kind of superhero team, I think it would be interesting to explore that in a in a game um but again i mean ultimately though i mean the nice thing is they are just, they are kind of superheroes it's their their powers aren't they're somewhat influenced thematically you know by who they are but the two aren't necessarily tied together um in, in like in a way that would affect gameplay that's the way i'm trying to to think about it um the other th one would be i love the idea of powers uh, which is Brian Michael Bendis and uh -huh. the incredible artist uh, Michael Oming, I think it is. Um, I love that idea of them investigating um, like superhero related crime. Uh -huh. And I think that would be an interesting to take for a game where you're detectives um, investigating that. Now, you know, with that game, you could take it down like the Portal Detective series kind of work uh you know yeah, perspective work. um or any kind of i think race against the clock type game or deduction game as well anything that has uh, michael's work on <laughs> on it would win me over and i i do think that's a part of like a lot of games we've talked about are solid games would we play them if they weren't superhero themed i don't know because i don't play the other other dice masters because they're not superhero themed I've played the D&D so, one, it's not bad. But I do think a big part of it is the the familiarity of the heroes and uh -huh. the, the kind of visual quality of, of what you're getting as well is kind of a, a big part of it. Um, so that's for me, powers would be, I don't really care what they'd make. I'd enjoy playing it with Michael's work. What about you, Michael? I don't know if I'm going to be allowed to have this one, but tough. I'm co-presenter, so what I say goes. Um, I would like... I can still kick you off the stream. I mean, true. <laughs> I want that... And it's gone. Uh, no, I would love to see something um, set in my favourite comic book of all time, The Wicked and the Divine. Oh, yes. Um, so, Kieran Gillen, Jane, uh, Jamie McKelvey... Um, I don't know if these people are heroes. They are certainly, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think they're just sort of like broken humans who happen to have incredible powers thrust upon them. Um, and I have no idea how you'd even begin to make a game built around this strange thing where gods become real every, you know, every few decades. And of course, because 
they become real in the early 2000s. They're just absolute celebrity pop superstars who also happen to be able to kill you by looking at you or send you into wild, you know, dynastic yeah. frenzy mm -hmm. just by singing that sort of stuff. Um, I, I think the reason that it really appeals is it, kind of twofold. Uh, number one is because it is very much a a beautifully created world. Uh, so Kieran Gillen just just made this incredible world. Like it, it you know, it's our universe, but it mm -hmm. just has this weird thing that also happens to happen every nearly hundred years. Um, but the thing that I also love, it, it's a very, it's this huge love letter to pop culture as well. Mm -hmm. And there are very few games that capture that. And you know, Rory, you and I. Michael uh, as well. I think we are the first sort of like generation to really freaking get pop cultured from day one. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it is just about music and frenzy and humanity and sadness and weirdness and loneliness and power and control. I think it's an amazing world that could be dipped into. Mm -hmm. um, now, game-wise, what do I think you could do? I, I think, to be honest, you could only really do an RPG mm -hmm. uh, built around it, but mm -hmm. it would be incredible, sort of like having you play, mem like you play members of the Pantheon. Mm -hmm. You you uh, base your characters based on these, um, you know, based on these different characters, uh, based mm -hmm. on these different gods and goddesses. It would be, I think, it'd be pretty cool. Yeah, so, sorry, uh, Yas is just one. Sorry, everybody. Oh, oh yeah. the game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want that. To, pick to show the game. Actually, yeah, the Peter Serafino which one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, I will accept that. Um, uh, one thing we totally skipped over. I realized uh, hmm. games about supervillains. Um, I mean, there's not too many where you play as the villains, but like, I just want to give a shout out to Word Domination from Towers yep. Games. Mm -hmm. um, Nefarious, delightful, and well themed, mm -hmm. um, and the art is great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah. I, I give a shout out there for Nefarious as well by Donald Vaccarino. Um, I think that was his first one after Dominion hit really big. Mm -hmm. um, I have the first and, edition of that. Yeah, I, I had the first edition of it. I gave it to a mate, um, but not you. Uh, you got your own one. It's yeah, that's cool. But yeah, it, and uh, there's the villains of the multiverse as well. Of yeah. course, if we go back to Sentinels and multiverse, although the that's actually just an extra play mode where mm -hmm. everyone is playing against a villain instead of just everyone playing against one villain. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a variant play mode, but it confuses a lot of people because they're like, "I want to play as the villain," but of course, in some of the later expansions, you can play as villains turned heroes. Mm -hmm. which is nice. What's one thing I want to throw out in terms of, because going back to what you are saying, Michael, about the Wicked and the Divine, because yeah. um, to me, it falls into the same kind of space, I guess, as phono is a phonogram? Yeah, well, same yeah. same team, yeah. Yeah, but that concept of it's set in, kind of, uh, in our world with that kind of like twist, so in phonogram, it's pe people gain their magical powers through music, doesn't mm -hmm. it? If I remember correctly. Yep. I... I think the way to make a superhero game work, and this is like the really tough thing, um, is picture this like a mashup between um, what two together studios are doing with the Adventure Zone, kind uh -huh. of like story crafting element, um, possibly like some element of um, the microscope or something. So I think you want to be able to tell an adventure, but in a contained space. Um, but the, the game needs some kind of, um, like what I consider loose association, what we allow for in, in story cubes. It's like, if you can make the, the connection, you can allow it. You know, if you can say, or you can at least propose, well, because I've got this ability or power, I can do X. But you need some kind of system to curtail that as in, well, there's a number of times you get to do this, or there's a voting system within the group that says, yeah, okay, that's acceptable. Yeah. But uh -huh. the game, you need a game that's going to allow you to make this like creative leap. And the problem in most games is the rules are so rigid, they won't allow allow for that. So you've either got like a hard 
kind of board game on one side with a fixed rule set, or mm-hmm. you've got the role playing game on the other side where you have a, a single adjudicator telling you what's possible or not. And it's like you need to find that space of bringing in some of that adjudication into the the board game space so that you get you get to kind of break outside of the confines of the rules because that's the whole point with the superpower is like you break the rules mm-hmm. but to do it in some kind of contained way so that when someone does it it's just like oh yeah that was like awesome even if it means you pay the, the price afterwards yeah so, and i think that again role-playing games do that so well it's really hard to get into tabletop games like board games and card games but it's something that i would love to see more of um mm-hmm. definitely in the future I think there's space for it in the market, and Mm -hmm. I'd love to see it on my shelf. I think I can picture it. Yeah. Let me know if you need a (laughs) co-designer. And with that, we shall bring this episode to a close. Um, Michael, thank you very much for your time, man. Michael, thank you very much for your time. And Rory, always a pleasure seeing you guys. Um, Someday we'll play a game at a convention again. Yes. It will happen one day. We'll wave at each other. Across uh, across the hall. Um, yeah. So, Michael, do you want to do uh, some more shameless Copper Frog plugging? Yeah. So, uh, again, my name is Michael. I run Copper Frog Games LLC. Um, my games are Pigment, uh, which is nearly sold out. Uh, you can buy it on copperfroggames.square.site or copperfroggames.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Chiseled, uh, recently released. It is available worldwide uh, through PSI. So. Alliance and other major distributors carry it. Excellent. Um, and it's really fun. It's a deck deconstruction game about sculpting marble, um, kind of an action drafting and set breaking set mm-hmm. uh, game. Cool, cool, cool. I love that idea. We've talked about like that. I yeah, think we've been talking about deck thinning, and then you showed me that. I was like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only other <laughs> game that I know of that does something that's really really close to this is abandon all artichokes mm-hmm. uh, game right and that game's just adorable um although i love artichokes so i don't mm-hmm. want to abandon them but i think you've you nailed the theme i think in terms of yeah. the mechanic i think you've come yeah up really well it, it makes sense it really mm-hmm. does it really does and <laughs> i think that um <laughs> well i'm hoping i'm not past my prime now but but like it's <laughs> It really, I think that is its biggest strength. Mm-hmm. It really feels like you're doing all these different things that kind of feel like what using the tool in real life would be like. Cool. All right, uh, Rory, you and I will be back on Friday. Yes. Uh, um, I what are we going to do? Tune the powers. I think we're going to play with the other four. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Looking forward you. to it and crushing you again. After my glorious victory last Friday. Yeah, they were seriously unbalanced. That was no fun. Well, deal with it. Guys, thank you so much for having me. This was a ton of fun. Um, happy to come back anytime. We truly appreciate it. No right. problem. All right. Cool. Uh, folks at home, thank you very much indeed for watching. As always, we'll see you on Friday. Uh, we'll mm-hmm. be back again next Wednesday with another uh, Hub Games Hangout. Do we have our guests sorted? We have the delightful, I don't know if that's the correct term, or delightful yet dour Ben Maddox. Oh, God almighty. All right, expect a two and a half hour show next week. It's going to be quite the event. All right. And this is where we wave. Okay, everybody, see you later on. Thanks very much indeed. We'll see you soon.